Are you ready for Windows Zinc? Well, ready or not, it's coming this fall in the form of the 23H2 update, better known as Windows 11 2023 edition. And today in Dave's Garage, we're taking an insider's look at what's coming next in Windows 11. From ChatGPT integration to the new file explorer, and even built-in RAR and virtual drive support. I'll tell you how you can get access to these new features right now, and we'll get a personal tour of them from an actual Windows Shell developer. Yep, that's me. So sit back, relax, and join me as I explore the cutting-edge features of Windows Zinc 2023 edition. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. It was actually a sneak peek at the then new Windows 95 user interface that prompted me to jump teams and join the Shell team almost 30 years ago. Then I spent more than a decade working on the Windows Shell specifically, like the Start Menu, File Explorer, Desktop, Task Manager, and so on, and so I get pretty excited when major new Shell updates come along. And this is the first big one in quite a while. The real news seems to be the integration of AI directly into Windows itself via Windows Copilot. Now, Copilot is essentially a sidebar that you can pop open to ask ChatGPT-like questions of your system, and it can perform certain operations like adjusting Windows settings or resolution and that kind of thing for you. You just tell it what it is that you want to do, and Copilot can do it for you, at least in theory. Let's take Copilot for a test drive to see just how capable it is. And to show you how it works, I'm first going to launch Notepad, and we'll just get that open here. Got it. Notepad now auto saves. Great. We'll park it on the right-hand side here so that when I hit the button for Windows Copilot, you can see it opens up and pushes it off to the left automatically. That way it doesn't obscure your windows. I'm going to ask Copilot to turn off dark mode and it will actually do the steps for me rather than just giving me a set of instructions with which to do it myself. So as soon as we say yes, there we go. Now, since this was AI, I was curious to see if it was smart enough to be able to undo whatever it just did. And so I asked it to do that and it offered to turn dark mode back off for me. So I say just undo whatever it is you just did, please, and it will go ahead and hopefully, let's see, there you go, turn on dark mode. And so somewhat impressively, it's able to undo what it just did. Now back at the desktop, I decided to kind of go about this in a naive fashion, just as you would, rather than through a scripted set of scenarios that I know work. So the first thing I'm going to ask it to do is to create an Excel spreadsheet that contains a conversion table from Celsius to Fahrenheit. That should be pretty easy for the AI to accomplish, and we'll see how it does. Now, it says it can create an Excel spreadsheet, but then it goes about the business of telling me the formula and then just spewing out raw text that I suppose I could copy and paste into Excel, but that doesn't really leverage being on the desktop. So, so this isn't quite ready, or at least not quite to where I thought it was. It also says that there's a link here that I can use to open it in Excel, but the link is empty. So that's a little confusing as well. Now, for all I know, Excel has to be running, so I'm going to open up Excel here and open up a, just a blank default workbook, and then we'll see if it has any better luck integrating with the actual application. Now, I'll let the AI know that I've opened Excel on my own and ask it to create the table within that Excel workbook. Let's see if we have any better luck than we did with it not actually running in the first place. And its rather hilarious response is that it can create the spreadsheet for me using its own words and knowledge. In other words, it's going to tell me the formula again and perhaps give me the data. No, in this case, it's going to tell me actually how to put in the formula and then it cascade it through the cells, which is fair. But I would like it to do it for me, ideally. I think Copilot has enormous potential and could, in time, be transformational for Windows. But for that to be true, however, there's going to have to be much tighter integration with applications and the ability to control and extract information to and from them. And that will require some kind of security model at a minimum and for developers to help accelerate that integration. Until then, I think it's a bit of a distraction, to be honest, but I can see where they're going, I hope. We also have to keep in mind that this is only a preview build, not even a beta yet, so we can't hold it accountable for being complete or bug-free. For now, it's tantalizing to consider what's possible if they do it right. We'll have to wait and see for the actual release to find out. While Copilot may not be quite ready for prime time, most of the other features in 23H2 are well thought out additions and are surprisingly stable. Let's drop down to the desktop and check them out. Now you may want to avert your eyes for the white flash that's going to happen. Ah, yeah, there it was. I don't know why that happens, but it seems like something that should be really easy to fix and I'm sure it isn't, but they should try really hard. 
Okay, although it looks familiar, I'm told a lot of this is actually fairly new code. This is the new file explorer and it sports a navigation bar which has buttons for back and forward and favorites as well as a parent folder button. Now back on my desktop, I've got a folder called archives and within it, I've got a RAR file, not a zip file, but a RAR file. And yet the shell is still showing the zip icon on it and it is in fact able to open it up. And because the shell namespace fully supports it, you can see there's a path all the way down and into the actual archive. And we're able to, as before with zip files, drag them out and copy files in and out of the archive. I should say, with zip files you are. With RAR, you're not allowed to copy into them. It's strictly a read-only system at this point for the non-zip formats. Regular fans of the channel might recall that I'm the one that wrote the original zip file support for Windows. And I'm not entirely certain whether it's been replaced entirely with this new universal library or not. Uh, actually, my gut feeling is that it still remains and that zip files are being handled specially because I noticed there are differences in the context menus and so on. And also the fact that you can drop into and write to zip files, but you can't in any of the other formats. And so I'm guessing at this point, you either are running still my old 1994-ish code, or they've replaced it. In addition to zip and rar, it also supports 7-zip and tar files at this point, and they have the infrastructure for adding others, so it would not surprise me to see other formats, if not already, added soon. Now, not to beat a dead horse, but I'm kind of curious to see if there's any kind of shell integration between Copilot and the shell itself. So I'm just going to ask it to find all the JPEG files on my computer. And so the net of it is, again, that it's going to explain to me how I should do it, but not do it for me. And that is, of course, useful, but it's not quite where I would like it to be yet. So let's abandon Windows Copilot for now and go back to the Explorer so we can have a look at Gallery View. That aggregates all of your media into one place, and if we click on something, we should see its details over in the right-hand pane. You can see its type and size, and you can trivially share the file here. I can simply type in, I'll put in my own name here, Dave PL, ms at hotmail.com. Please don't email me unless you really need to. And send. And so it makes it pretty trivially easy to share a file, and you can also copy the link here and then paste that into a text message or into a email message. One handy new feature that you've seen on the Mac and now comes to Windows is the ability to tear out a tab. So if I open this in a new tab and then pull it off and drop it on the desktop, I get a separate window. So now I have two file explorers. And if I use the docking zones, I can then pretty easily tile them left and right. And so the tear off tabs work pretty much exactly as you would expect that they should work. And they're a welcome addition to the shell. One new feature in the shell is ironically actually a way to go back to an old behavior. So let's start up three notepads here. And here goes two, and here goes my third notepad. Now you'll see we only have one icon on the tray for all three, and we have to mouse over it and hover. And then we actually get a hover menu that allows us to pick one of the three. But if that's not the behavior you like, and you like the way it used to work, you can go into Taskbar Settings, and we'll scroll down to Taskbar Behaviors. And one of the check through the options here, automatically hide, show badges, show flashing, show any window, blah, blah, blah. We want never for combined task buttons and hide labels. And you can actually pick when full too is pretty reasonable, but this way you actually get one tab for each of them. That's the way it used to work and that's the way I likes it. One other setting that's worth mentioning here, even though it's not technically new to 23H2, is the ability to move the start menu back to the bottom left corner by changing here to left in taskbar alignment. That puts the menu back in the left and your weather icon and so forth moves just to the right. I prefer to anchor my menu on the bottom left because I think it makes more sense on a mouse-based monitor. I can see the argument both ways, but personally, I prefer it bottom left. Here's a quick and handy feature that you have to turn on in Developer Settings. So go to Settings, and then System. And under System, go to For Developers. And under For Developers, we'll find End Task, and we'll turn that on. With that turned on, we'll launch Notepad to give you an example. So with Notepad running, I can right click and now I have an end task option. It appears that end task does something of an orderly shutdown and will offer to save your work. Of course, now Notepad automatically saves your work as you write, so we didn't need to worry about it in that particular case. There's one other handy twist, but to get at it, we need to go back to our old taskbar behavior, or actually the new taskbar behavior of grouping everything. 
so that we turn it back always on. We can see that all three notepads are grouped under one, but now we have end all tasks. And if we select that, it will try to kill them all. Now, in this case, they're going to prompt to save because there was unsaved work, but in a normal case, you can also end now if the process is hung. Let's take a look at virtual disks. We need to go into settings and we'll type in volumes here and we're looking for manage disks and volumes. Once in there, go to the advanced storage settings, scroll down and find disks and volumes. Here we can create a VHD by clicking on create VHD. We'll give it a name, my disk, something like that. I'll even spell it wrong. We'll give it a location and we'll say it is one gigabyte. We'll stick with VHDX, the newer format, and we'll say dynamically expanding so it doesn't use room until we put files in it. GPT is fine. And we'll give it a label, definitely not porn. Drive letter E, format. There are advanced options here, but we won't worry about them for now. We'll simply use this format dialog that was obviously originally crafted by a very handsome developer. And we've now got a formatted virtual drive. If we go into this PC, we can see it there as drive E and we can open it up and it acts just like a normal hard drive, but it's a virtual drive. We can place files in it and so on, but it, more interesting is that we can lock it using BitLocker. To do that, we'll give it a password option here by giving it a password and duplicate that password. Click next and we will save it in our Microsoft account, but you may choose differently. We'll say encrypt only the used disk space and we'll start encrypting. This should go pretty quick, which it did. And now we have an encrypted, but currently unlocked drive. If we pick eject, and then go back to see where we stored the virtual drive and try to reopen it, you'll see we get an error message. Not very intuitive here, but it actually has mounted it. The problem is it's still locked. So all we need to do is to right click on the drive and pick unlock drive, enter our password. Hopefully they center this dialogue at some point in the future. And now we can access our drive with BitLocker on. We can place a file in it, and this file will be fully encrypted with BitLocker. If you want to test drive all these new features right now, I'll show you how you can do it. But I do strongly recommend that you do it on a virtual machine or a spare desktop machine and not on your main system, as tempting as it may be. It's still pre-release software, so keep that in mind. To get the latest and greatest bits, all you need to do is first register as a Windows Insider and then turn on that setting in your Windows Update. Let's have a look. To access the settings, we need to change our updates. We first go to updates and say check for updates. And then we're looking for the bar here that says Windows Insider Program. My machine is already joined to this program, of course, in order to show you the build. But here you could click on becoming a Windows Insider. And here's where you register. And that gives you eligibility to become a Windows Insider. I don't believe there's any cost now. Once you have it, you could, of course, leave the Insider program or select a channel to participate in. Canary Channel is the latest and greatest, probably near daily builds. Dev Channel is the best self-host build, I imagine. And then we have the beta and the release preview, which are less uh, aggressive in the sense that they're closer to being higher quality, but they come out less often. I don't believe you can go backwards either, so that's why I have those grayed out. And to reiterate, I don't recommend that you run this on your main machine or any machine that's important or that you rely on, but have fun in a VM or on a spare desktop. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel. And if you believe that you already are a subscriber, I do have a favor to ask. Please check your subscription status to verify you haven't been unknowingly unsubscribed. And be sure to turn on the all option for notifications if you'd like to actually see my future videos. It's at most one a week, so you won't get inundated. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please be sure to check out the free sample of my book in the link in the video description. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known way back then. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I'll see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.